This is a Blaring Out with Eric Blair show, and today I'm pleased to have iconic rock goddess and founding member of The Runaways, Lita Ford, on the show. How you doing today, Lita? Doing awesome. After The Runaways broke up in 1979, what steps did you take to make Out for Blood, your first album in 1983, happen? First of all, I wanted to establish myself as a guitar player. And being in The Runaways... Uh, coming out of a group and being a female, nobody really looked at me as a guitar player. So I thought, how can I establish myself as a guitar player? I've got to be the only guitar player in the band. I can't give them anybody else to look at, like another guitar player. So I was thinking to myself, Hendrix, Jimi Hendrix, a three-piece band. He's got guitar, bass, and drums. There's no one else to look at. So therefore, nobody can say, it's not her playing, it's him. And that left me looking for a lead vocalist because I didn't want to be the lead singer. I wanted to just play guitar. I wasn't the lead singer in The Runaways. I, I sang backup, but uh, then that found me looking for a lead singer, and I couldn't find anybody. I, I couldn't find anybody that, that could sing what I wanted to hear. And uh, the only solution to that was for me to do it myself. And there, here I am, stuck being a guitar player and being the lead singer at the same time. I, I couldn't do it. So I started taking vocal lessons. Um, I rented a warehouse and I put my marshals in this warehouse and I got a PA system. And I just started singing and playing and making mistakes and fucking up. And I just kept trying and playing and taking vocal lessons. And I would go to different concerts and watch my favorite players that do sing and play at the same time. And they were inspiring, like um, uh, Johnny Winter. Mm -hmm. Johnny Winter was one that I, I loved his playing. He was so flawless and he made everything look so easy just walked around jamming and um, of course Hendrix. I nailed it. I mean, I was able to, I took the dots off my guitar neck. I took the, the frets off. Um, and so I, even if I did look at the neck, I didn't know where I was. I had to make it so I didn't have to look at the neck and I could feel my way through, through the neck and through the right chords. So I got it, I got it. It took a while, but I got it. I heard that you had some odd jobs uh, doing some stuff before you actually, you know, got your deal. Well, some of them are true and some of them are not. Okay. Um, I did pump gas. I worked at a major department store and it was like Bloomingdale's or something like that. But it just, it was so wrong. It was so wrong. I didn't feel right. I couldn't dress right. I couldn't speak right. It just didn't work. So it didn't last. Um, I mean, I was better off pumping gas, you know, <laughs> um, that I did do. And then I, um, I was a gym instructor for a little while and That's cool. I, I led these workout classes and, uh, the, the one woman says to me, your classes aren't very good. And I said, ah, oh, fuck you. <laughs> and she, then I got fired. I figured, you know what, I'm not cut out for this. This is just not working. Then you do Dancing on the Edge, and you tour extensively on that album. Before 88, you're hanging out with Tony Iommi from Black Sabbath. Yeah. You're, you're, you have a relationship with him. There was an album that you guys worked, he, he produced called The Bride Wore Black, correct? That's not correct. Okay, what is it? It is The Bride Wore Black, but he didn't have anything to do with it. Oh, really? I, yeah, he didn't produce it. Okay. I don't know where it, see, there's there's so many things out there that people are getting wrong. And uh, I, I'm actually working on my book now that I'm going to correct some of those for people so they know the real thing. And one, another one is they, they think my real name is Carmelita. I'm not a Carmelita. Well, I heard one song you recorded with him, like an, uh, a B.B. King cover. Is oh, that yeah. Yeah, that was just us messing around. Okay. I don't even know how that got released. It was just us screwing around, literally screwing around in the studio, just wasting time. So for fans who want to know, that's the extent of your collaborations on tape with Tony Iommi. Well, Tony did a little clip in the beginning of uh, Dressed to Kill video where he says, you are dressed to kill. 
And then then that's pretty much it. What did you learn from Sharon Osbourne when she was your manager? Yeah, Sharon's wonderful. I, um, she, she taught me a lot of things, actually. She really took Lita and brought me (laughs) to a higher level. She put me on some uh, great shows, a wonderful tour with Bon Jovi that we did, the Wembley shows, those were all from Sharon. She taught me a lot about mannerism, and she's a very classy person. I learned a lot from the, from that. I was just blessed to for, to have her as my manager at the time. Did she pick Mike Chapman, or did you choose Mike Chapman to produce that Lita record? I actually had Mike Chapman already. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a record deal. I had Mike Chapman. I had written and finished the album. Wow. The only thing missing out of my life was a manager. I didn't have a manager. And I didn't want a manager at the time because I wanted to be able to record, pick who I wanted as a producer. And I didn't want a manager saying, don't do that song, do this song. You know, I just wanted to just get through that part and then get the manager involved. And Sharon walked in and just took the whole package and put it to work. And what was it like working with Mike Chapman? Because he worked with Pat Benatar, he worked with, with The Sweet, he worked with a lot of great you know, bands that put out smoking songs. He's a wonderful man and just a real joy to be around. And which is huge because when you make a record, it takes a long time. Like for instance, Living Like a Runaway took me one year to make. And if you don't like somebody, the last thing you want to do is hang out with them. So. It's just a real joy to, to be around Mike Chapman. He was always so mellow, and he never lost his temper. And he really made you feel good about yourself, which makes you perform totally. better. You know, it gives yeah. you that confidence. I could relate to him in a way. Like, he would say something to me like, Lita, sing it like Elvis. Like, come on, pretty baby. Kiss me deadly. You know, and I, I understood what he meant. It was like, oh, yeah, cool, I can do that. So uh, he was just a perfectionist and uh, wrote some of the best songs in the planet. How did you change as a person after the success of the 1988 Lita record? I don't know that I really did. Really? You know, I, I, don't, I still don't feel... I, I, I'm just now starting to feel like I finally grew up, honestly. After having two children and being married for 20, almost 20 years, 17 years, and uh, I feel like with Living Like a Runaway, I finally grew up. And you can hear it in the music. There's a complete change. I was just always just Lita, just the same, you know, right through everything. Sharon would always get mad at me for stuff, you know, just... (laughs) I was always in trouble, you know, I was getting letters shoved under my door by people in the management and just always grow up Lita, you know, was, no, I don't want to leave me alone. So now I feel like I've finally got a grip on, uh, my life a little more and, uh, more, um, more responsible, I guess you could say, you know, uh, well, that is being an adult is being responsible and not rebelling as much, I guess. Yeah, well, rebelling's fun. I still do that. Uh, how did the duet with Ozzy Osbourne, if you close, if I close my eyes forever, how'd that come about? Actually, it was an accident, that mm-hmm. song. We, we were in the studio. We were recording the leader record, and um, Ozzy came in, and we were playing pool, and we had a couple drinks, and we went to this little room that we had off to the side of the pool table. It was like a closet, and we had a little amp, little guitar and we went in there and we started messing around on guitar and he started singing and next thing I know the sun was coming up and we had this song written close my eyes so he, he looks at me and he says the sun's coming up and I went yeah oh my god we better go home and uh, he says you driving me home and I said no way I can't drive And we were up and over Laurel Canyon, down the other side of that windy canyon. I lived on this side of the canyon. He lived on that side of the canyon. And there was no way I was going to make it over and then back again. So I told him, you got to take a cab, dude. So he he takes a cab back to his house. And I get a phone call from Sharon about two hours later. And she was mad at me. Uh She was angry. And I just said, you know, 
sorry, we didn't mean to stay out all night, but we got a great song. And Ozzy Osbourne, sweet guy. He's very talented. He really is, and I, I don't like it that people pick on him, you know, for the way he is. He's a character. Yeah. But he's talented. He's just. Hey, well, he's a great singer. Eccentricity is a part of being a rock star, or being a celebrity, because you, that's what makes you stand out from the crowd. Yes, it's true. You're a character. I mean, just like I'm a character, or Keith Richards, or yeah, Mick absolutely. Jagger. You know, you could paint them. You could draw them. They're, you know, they're characters. Ozzy and his little glasses. And he's, he's a wonderful man. He really is. And he's been through a lot, and um, he, he's changed the face of music with Black Sabbath, mm -hmm. Tony Iommi, and it wouldn't be what it is today if not for them. How did you meet Nikki Six, and what do you love about him as a person and a songwriter? I met Nikki in the Troubadour one night. I was sitting at a table with a bunch of girls. We were talking girl talk, and one of the girls asked me, Lita, if you could go out with any guy in this club it, what would he look like and who would you go out with? And I sat there and I looked around the room and I thought, hmm, and I'm checking out all the guys in the club. And for some reason, Nikki walked by and I went, that one. And so she says to me, oh, really? Well, let me see you go up to him and say something. So I said, okay. So I walked up to him and I said, hey, you want a Quaalude? <laughs> <laughs> and he says, yeah. <laughs> so that started our relationship yeah. but uh, as a songwriter he is um, very unique in his writing um, you can tell when it's, it's something's written by Nikki you know it, it, his writing is very uh, original um, the way he phrases his lyrics and stuff he's a creator he's a leader mm -hmm. he's not a follower you know, you yeah. have your leaders, you have your followers. Nikki is a leader, and he is Motley Crue, yeah, you know. Absolutely. He's the architect of Motley Crue. Yes, he is. Yeah. You know what's amazing to me is how you guys have stayed such great friends over the years. Um, well, you know, we both went off and we did our own thing, and Nikki has a family, and, and uh you know, we both disappeared. You got a song from him for the new album. But it was weird the way that song came about because I, I really didn't have any Nikki Six songs on my laptop. And uh, all of a sudden, the song pops up on my laptop and says, a song to slit your wrist by mm -hmm. Nikki Six. And I looked and I thought, what is this? I have to listen to it. So I, I listened to it and I thought, whoa, what is this, like a sign from God or something? Because I feel like the whole album was really directed by God. The Things happened in the most weirdest way, and that song is one of them. So I, I asked Nikki, what is this song? Can I use it? Can I have it? And he says, sure, go ahead. It's a song I wrote 15 years ago. And... Uh, we did a remake of it. I, I asked him for his ideas, you know, what kind of twist would you put on it if you were to redo it? And he said he would give it a, more of a Nine Inch Nails yeah. vibe, an industrial vibe. And we tried to give it a little bit of an industrial vibe, but not overdo yeah. it, you know. So it came out great, and Gary Hoey as a producer just killed it. A lot of people that I've played the album for think that that song, um, a song to slit your wrist by, mm -hmm. it sounds a little bit like garbage. Which is a compliment. Cool. Shirley Manson is awesome. You love her, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm glad. Lita, at some point you you fall in love and get married. The first you you end up with Chris Holmes from Wasp, yeah. and uh, you hang out with him for a while. You're married to him for a while, but then essentially that doesn't work out. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. It, it was just uh, kind of a flash in the pan, actually. Chris is a great guy, and uh, I, I love him very much, but uh, we weren't meant to be married. But then you marry Jim, Jim Gillette, okay, from Nitro. How did being a full-time mom differ from being a full-time rock star? Mm, boy. Well, they're both uh, full-time jobs, you know. Um, they do take all of you. Um, I wasn't one to have babysitters or 
daycare. Um, I took my kids 24 seven. I took them with me everywhere. Um, we lived in the Caribbean on a des literally on a deserted island. There's nothing on this island. And I ended up having to homeschool my children. I really didn't want to um, because I'm not a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, but I enjoyed it. And uh, it made me very close to my kids. And uh, we both grew. You know, the kids grew and learned. And I grew and learned together. It was interesting. And I did things like I hated school when I was a kid. I hated school. I just despised going out, anything to get out of school. I would go and ditch school and go and jam with the guys down the street, you know. And then I would come home and my mom would say, hey, how was school today? And I would say, oh, it was great, mom. You know, little did she know, I didn't go. But uh, I would teach my kids um, what the way I wished I was taught. And I would make things fun for them. You know, because some people are saying, oh, Lita, how, Lita's not a teacher. No, I'm not a teacher, but I had to teach my kids because there was no way I was going to let them grow up and not know how to read and not know how to write, not know their math, their arithmetics or multiplication. You know, all this stuff you don't think about that you forget over the years. Mm -hmm. It comes back to you when you do homeschool. And uh, it, it's good. It's good. But... Then there's socialization, which wasn't really something that was able to happen on the island. Mm -hmm. There was nobody on that island. It's, weird. it's just, I don't know. We would fly people in that had friends, and they would hang and stay for a few days, and the kids would play. And then we would go to the U.S., and we would hang out in the U.S. But... Um, I don't know. It's it's not a place that I think it, it's a vacation place. Uh -huh. It's good for vacation. So at some point, did you did you feel like I want to get the kids out of here? I feel like they're old enough to to take them to the United States permanently. Um, I tried to, yeah. Uh huh. So so you were offered you, your family was offered a reality show with TLC, mm -hmm. and that never came to fruition. Can you tell me what happened with that? Yeah, um, the TLC show, <clears throat> it was, it, the TLC show happened right as I filed for divorce. Oh. So it was based on my family, but how do you do a family reality show if you don't have a family? Yeah, no. We split. Uh -huh. So it was the end of it. I told TLC, I'm sorry, I can't do this. And I was unhappy. Yeah, you, I don't know what happened between you guys, but and I'm I'm sorry that that had to happen. But, but as you know, life is, is can be very difficult sometimes. You've bounced back with this new album, "Living Like a Runaway," and I'm wondering how empowering was it for you to record "Living Like a Runaway." Oh God, I I listen to it now and I just go, whoa. Yeah. That's a serious album, you know, and such a headspace. I was in such a headspace when I wrote that album. And I was determined to get it out and determined to finish it. And I wanted to find the right people to work with. And I just kept pushing my way through. No, you aren't going to work. No, you you aren't going to work. And there was only a very, very small, small handful of people that really did end up working on this record. Very small handful, especially it was me and Gary. Mm, Gary, Hoey. Gary Hoey just took the bull by the horns and helped me create this album. What do you feel that Gary Hoey brought to the table as a producer? You know, he is probably one of the best producers if not the best producer I've ever worked with because he brings out the best in he brought out the best in me as an artist which is what a producer is supposed to do mm -hmm. he made me feel good about myself he made me feel comfortable um, 
as a guitar player, he's phenomenal and brought out the best in me as a guitar player. We can relate to each other on that level. Um, and vocally, he's a great singer and he's got a beautiful studio. Once we got in that studio and we closed the door and everything went away, all, you know, every thought that was in my head, other than keeping focus on this record, everything disappeared except for the record. And the same with Gary, he just really focused. We have a, a lyricist that we worked with. Whenever Gary was at loss for music and I was at loss for music, we would look at each other and go, now what? We're stuck. But we kept pushing and pushing and we would bring in a third person, Michael Dan Emig, who is a, a lyricist. And he writes the most incredible lyrics, just over the top. And uh, we would get him on the phone and we would say, Michael, we're stuck. This is what we've got so far. Now what? And he would throw something out at, at us that's like, whoa, Michael, you saved the day. Oh my God, that is so awesome. And we would walk away and go, yeah, we did it. You know, so it, Michael would always get us over the top if, if we got stuck. So the three of us really teamed up together. The thing about the lyrics of this album is that they are so you and so a part of what was going on in your life at the time. So I'm wondering, did you tell Michael, look, this is what I'm feeling emotionally? Yeah, Michael is one of my best friends. Okay. And uh, I confide in him. He's known me for years. Okay. The first song he wrote, we wrote together was Lisa. That was the song from my mother when she passed away from breast cancer. And I couldn't think of the lyrics to write for my mother. She's, she's dying. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's your mother. Yeah. How do you put that into words? So I reached out and I found Michael. And Michael and I clicked right away. And uh, the first song we wrote was, was Lisa. And because of that song, we really bonded. And... Uh, I consider him one of my few, very few close, close friends, brothers. He's my brother. And he knows me like the back of his hand. So when I say to him a song title, and I'll say, for instance, I'll say, Black. Black is a song title. What is black? It's an attitude. Gotcha. So I'd hang up the phone, and about an hour or two later, he will email me three pages of lyrics, Sweet. all that go with black attitude. What is it? Your soul, your whole, or the shape you're in. <laughs> you know, and we would pick the best out of the three pages of lyrics, and we would composite them together. And um, they were awesome. They were just over the top like the devil in my head love don't come easy for a lonely soul like me i find myself in trouble on a road of misery i try to do the right thing but i'm easily misled i'm drawn to the dark side and the devil in my head it's just sick. The guitar tone on that is so shit dun 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 What inspired that song? Yeah. Oof, God. You're going to have to get my book when it comes out. <laughs> um, people that get inside your head, demons, that everybody has a demon, you know? There was a girl... Um, in Corpus Christi, one of the shows we did, and she was standing in the corner after the show had been over for hours, and we, we had our bus parked out by the, sh by the show. We were just waiting for the driver, and uh, she was standing in the corner. She was very pretty, and she was by herself, and I walked up to her, and I said, hi, and she looks at me, and she says, hi. And I said, you have horns. And she says, it's the devil in my head. And I went, whoa. And she had fangs. And I thought, shit, she scared me. And I said, what's your demon? 
And she said, food. My demon is food. And I said, what do you mean? She says, I dance my ass off every night to your music. I wanted to lose weight. She lost 165 pounds. Wow. She said, I still have a ways to go. She was a little tiny but chubby, but she was beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, wow. I held her in my arms and she was crying and shaking. And I understood her food, her demon was food. It was the devil in her head. We all have demons. Some are sex, some are drugs. Some are, I don't know, beating, beating up people. I mean, there's, there's a lot of demons in people. So uh, that's the devil in my head. There's definitely a theme in this record. I hear you uh, saying in certain songs that you, you know, angels protecting me, and that you, you, you cry, you know, you pray to God. In, in, in some of the lyrics, you're saying, "I pray to God," and then you actually call somebody Satan in one, in one of the songs. Mm -hmm. um, so, are you a spiritual person? No. Well, spiritual, yes, I would say. Religious, no. There's a difference. You know, I don't want people to think that I'm I'm really not religious. I don't go to church. I don't read the Bible. I don't do any of those things. But I do believe in God, and I do believe that He is watching over me. Were you raised, like, Catholic? Yeah. Okay, so you believe that Jesus... Do you believe Jesus is God? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I really don't know, because it seems like they're two different people. It seems like God is from a higher level than Jesus. Jesus is, I, I, I don't know. I don't know who God is. You know, that song, just a stranger on a bus, it's true. It's like, really, who is God? I don't know. So you may be on a spiritual journey right now and not even realize it. I know I'm on a spiritual journey. I know it. I can feel it. The asylum. Yeah. What's that about? The asylum is like being... Being caught in a prison, being caught in a place where you can't escape and you can't get out, like Alcatraz, like the Alcatraz prison in San Francisco. I mean, it's not about that, but um, you can't get out. You can't escape. There's no escape. And no one seems to help you. No one seems to hear you. When you cry for help, no one helps. No one hears you. A lot of these songs make me think you, you're saying what was going on in your relationship that you just got out of. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking your home was the asylum, okay? The devil in your head was your husband. I'm sorry for, for if this upsets you, but this is how I'm interpreting these songs. And even though Nikki Six wrote it, a song to slit your wrist by is kind of like implied to somebody that is really done you wrong so uh, uh, essentially am i kind of hitting it on the head on the head so okay so then we can move on that's awesome in the light of your divorce from jim gillette and not being allowed to see your kids how hard was it for you to perform the vocals for the song mother mm. oh really hard i uh i just did a video for mother wow. and um we had to stop shooting a few times. It, I get choked up. Um, but uh, it is what it is, and I've accepted it. I know my kids will be back mm -hmm. to find me. I know they will. And uh, that's something that I don't keep quiet. Like a lot of people don't speak about things. I um, I don't see anything wrong with talking about it. I want my children to know how much I love them. And I'm not the only person that this has happened to. I was just reading People magazine. Um, Tom Cruise is on the cover. It's new, it's in the stores now. And there's a story on uh, Kelly Rutherford, mm -hmm. the actress. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a battle a custody child custody battle she's going through where the judge had granted the children go and live with the husband in Germany mm. and she's in Los Angeles I believe she's in New York I think either way mm. it's a 
it's it's what nine hour plane yeah. flight mm -hmm. nine hour plane flight to go see your kids it's grueling and she's working in the u.s and uh it's horrible it's just horrible things happen and people do get away with murder i mean they really do I, I don't want to bring it up, but look at OJ, you know? What, what happened there? What was that? How is he walking around? I, I just, people do get away with things. Everything now in society is how can we wear you down, okay? So it's who, yeah. who has the bigger lawyer? Who has the more money? How, who's going to get worn down the quickest? Yeah, that's true. It's absolutely 100% true. So yep. that may be what's kind of happening to you right now. Is I'm not a liar. You know, I, I don't know how to lie. I, I don't know how. Mm -hmm. And there's an evil and there's a good. And I don't know the evil side of life. I've never been there. I don't know how it works and how it thinks. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I know now because I've seen it. But before, I didn't. I didn't know. It's like like Snow White and the Huntsman, that movie, mm -hmm. where it's a battle against good and evil. You know, Snow White is good and the Charlie's is evil. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what my life was like, that movie. I think things are going to work out for you. I definitely think so, because yeah. I have God looking over me. How would you define the word love? Oh, boy. Love. Um, unconditional, trusting, <laughs> always there for you, no matter what, and, uh, nice to touch. <laughs> <laughs> what brings you the most peace in your life right now? My guitars, you know, sometimes I don't feel good or I've got a stomach ache or a headache or I'm tired or I want to just break something. I put on my guitar, you know, and I feel all my pain goes away. What do you consider your greatest achievement to date? Oh, boy. I've got a lot of them. I think my greatest achievement would be my fans. My fans are, are the most amazing people. I, I really get into talking to them and, and we Facebook and you know I talk to them at the shows and their stories of their life and the way they live their life is so incredible. And who they are and just the, the love they give back to me, it's unconditional. How did it feel to be rocking arenas again on the Def Leppard <laughs> Poison Tour? It was awesome. It was the best summer. I, I couldn't have asked for a better summer. Joe Elliott says to me, are you watching the Def Leppard show again tonight? And I said, Joe, I can't think of a better way to spend my summer than watching Def Leppard every night. Exactly. I mean, does it get any better than no, that? No, come on. No, and I'm the only one on the side of the stage. You know, they kick everybody off the stage. So I'm there by myself, just rocking out, just no one's in my ear, no one's in my face, just having a good time. You know, I, I watched all, there's just such brilliant musicians. They really, really are. And Rick, God bless him, he is a leader. To get up after that car accident mm -hmm. that he had and come back and playing like he plays, I mean, it, it, he's phenomenal and he's such a, such a big heart mm -hmm. and soul in that man he's a monster what's your favorite Def Leppard album oh god the first Def, Def Leppard record on through the night when they were 16 oh, high and dry which was produced by Mutt Lang yes. and then pyromania which was their huge breakout album yeah. which was produced by Mutt Lang right 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 I mine would be pyromania okay yeah I, I'm a high and dry guy because it's so metal but I love that the one is one line it goes Gypsy sitting looking pretty, broken words and laughing eyes. I think like, that's me. That's what I feel like. 
you know, broken yeah. words and laughing eyes. You know, you're just a mystery, always running wild, like a child without a home. And that, that's that's what I feel like right now, because I'm really, I just moved from, from Florida to Los Angeles, and um, when I left my house, when I left my husband, I didn't have a home, and uh, I didn't know where I was going to stay. I didn't know where I was going. I just left. I just walked out the door and didn't know what I was doing, didn't, didn't have a roof over my head. And um, I understand people that don't have money. I understand people that don't have a lot. You know, I've been there. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, I, I can relate. And it's not nice. It's not a good feeling. It's not something I would want ever again. So I, I understand why sometimes there's not a lot of people in the audience or the concerts aren't sold out. And Joe, Joe would say to me, I hate to see those empty seats. And I'm like, yeah, Joe, people don't have money, you know? And you'd be in a certain city like, um, I don't know, outside of Cleveland somewhere. And it's a poor town. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of money in that particular town. And uh, you just don't understand why there's not 20,000 people in the audience. What has been your secret to not becoming a casualty to sex, drugs, booze, and hangers on? <laughs> oh, God. Well, I love hangers on. Uh, I think they're awesome. Um, and... Uh, the booze, I don't know, after the last night of the tour, I don't think I ever want to get drunk again in my life. Um, sex. Uh, I'm more interested in playing my guitar right now. You know, that turns me on. Uh, the rock and roll, it's my life. Who is in your touring band and how did you choose them? Um... Well, we have Mitch Perry on guitar, uh, Scott Coogan on drums, Marty O'Brien on bass. I didn't want to put a keyboard player in this tour. I wanted to go out shredding on guitars. And each person was picked not only for their musical talent, but for their personality. Because we're together on tour, I want everyone to get along. I don't want any fighting. I want everybody happy. And uh, the personalities are all great. They're all great together, right down to our guitar tech. Everybody gets along, you know. We all listen to who who's in charge, you know. Everyone does what they're supposed to do at the time they're supposed to do it. And we, we got our shit together. What did you think of the Runaways film and Scout Taylor Compton's portrayal of you? Now, I know she met you because she told me herself at the premiere. So tell me what you thought of that movie and her performance. Uh, I love Scout. I actually never saw the movie. <laughs> I, I saw the trailers and uh, I, I saw a part where I, I think it's supposed to be me. Kicking somebody in the chest? Really? And I've never kicked anybody in the chest. So that right there was enough for me. Um, Scout, when I met her, she was very much like me. I was talking to her in the hallway in Lake Tahoe. She had driven up from Los Angeles, and we were standing in the hallway talking, and she all of a sudden coughs and hawks up this big loogie and spits it in the corner on the rug behind Ew. the Coke machine in the hallway. And I thought, oh my God, she's really, she really is like Lita. And it's like, whoa, what a perfect person to play me. And I just fell in love with her. And ironically, at the time, she was dating Andy Six from the Black Veil Brides. Oh, wow, oh, how what? cool. <laughs> So life repeating itself. I love it. I love it. What do you love about BC Rich guitars? For a long, long time, I've played BC Rich. Um, Bernie Rico was the originator of BC Rich guitars. And uh, since he's passed away, Bill Xavier has taken over the company. And uh, he is 
trying to bring back Beastie Rich the way they were. Mm -hmm. And he's done a great job. He's a great man, and he's brought in some really wonderful people to help him recreate the original BC Rich guitars. Mine is a signature model. It's the Black Widow Warlock. I name my guitars because, I don't know, you got so many, you got to give them a name. Yeah. Not just the black one or the white one. It's You got to give them names. So it, mine's, my Black Widow Warlock's name is Maurice. And uh, BC Rich have created Maurice Jr. And they're for sale at all the music shops. You can order them if they're not there, or if, if they are, if they have them, you, you can pick up a Lita Ford signature model. Is it the feel or the look of the guitar or both? Oh, it's definitely the look and the feel. I mean, the sound. I helped uh, Bill when he did create the Black Widow Warlock. Mm -hmm. He took my original BC Rich. I gave it to him for a while, and they examined it inside and out. And they took all the dimensions and they recreated it. So it is an exact duplicate of my guitar, original. And uh, we put in some Seymour Duncan pickups that just smoke. They rock. And uh, we're using Dee Markley strings and um, it just sounds great. They're just beautiful guitars. And it's kind of a statement, you know? It, it, you see that and... Oh, yeah. You see rock, you yeah. see power, energy. I mean, Mick Mars, Nikki Six, those guys rocked those gu those guitars yeah. and basses in the 80s. And I mean, those they're just a standard. They never go away. Now, one of the things I've noticed about you is that you have new ink. Okay, maybe it's not super new, but <laughs> it's new to me. Uh, you know, looking at photos of you. Is this, this is semi-new, correct? This is my kid's Gillette. It's, um, yeah. It, well, I've had it for about four years now, okay. thinking. And then this is my son's birthday in Roman numerals, and it's May 13th. He was born on our wedding day, three years, well, it's three years after we got married, but May 13th, we were married on Friday the 13th, mm. and uh, my son was born on wow. May 13th, my first son, James. And then this is a cover-up, and of course this is Black Widow. Is the yeah the symbol the symbol Black, Wid Black Widow. So you do your own makeup, yeah, and you're good. So what what do you have to have? What are your must-haves? What will you not like go on the road without having? <laughs> uh, my lips are always dry from the microphone rubbing on the wire on the microphone, so I gotta have something on my lips. Chaps, even if it's just chapstick. But um, some sort of lip stuff, lip goo, I call it. What's next for Lita Ford? A book. I just signed with Harper Collins. Oh, sweet. Book. You're stoked. Have you found that ghostwriter yet that you were looking oh, for? Oh, yes, I have. Joel Selvin. He wrote the Eddie Hardy story. And, and I don't know if that's out yet. I'm not quite sure. I know it's been delivered, but I'm not sure if it's been released. Also, he wrote Sammy Hager's book. He's very colorful in his writing, and a lot like Living Like a Runaway. That's a colorful album. You can visualize things when you listen to it. And I wanted my book to be the same. I wanted you to be able to see, feel, visualize everything. And Joel's writing you, you can do all that. He, he makes you be able to see the colors and feel the pain and feel the love and laugh and hate. And it's all in his writing. He's the man. Your book is going to be awesome. And then I'm going to be looking forward to seeing that movie. <laughs> Me too. And this is going to be the truth. <laughs> yes, definitely the truth. Well, Lita Ford, thank you so much for being on the Blaring Out with Eric Blair show. You rock. Thank you. Appreciate it. Blaring Out with Eric Blair with Lita Ford signing off. Bye-bye. <laughs> See ya. The Blaring Out show.